something seems too hard to handle, too big to conquer, too far away to touch. When all your dreams begin to shatter. So much that's when it's time to say Sing and start to say Good morning. It's, uh, I'm really happy to see everybody, especially uh, Sister Norwood and Brother Norwood and Tommy and just really everybody. Well, let's go ahead and stand. We'll open up with prayer. Let's see. Brother Brian, can you pray for the service? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come once again into your house, dear Father. We thank you for all that you've done for us, the good Sunday school that we had this morning, Lord, we ask that you come down and fill us with your spirit, Father, and help us to worship you in spirit and truth, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank
Amen. Does anybody have a song or a testimony on their heart this morning? Okay. Let's pray for the youth choir.
God is definitely able. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord just to be here. Yes. I thank him because I want to stand for him because he has stood for me. Amen. Amen. From the very beginning a month ago when this happened to me, he's been right there with me every step of the way. When they'd come in every night and want to know if I need anything for pain, I'm not having any pain. Praise God the whole time. On 
long time I had pain was when I had the accident. Amen. When they operated on me, no pain. Thank the Lord. The pain that I've had is just been in the leg that I injured also. But you know, every step, Amen. every day, he's been right there. Amen. I marvel. I know. And I, I knew that he could do it all along. But when he did it, it was just really something. <coughs> I can't explain it, but I can tell you, praise Amen. God. Amen. Thank he Lord. did it, and he's still doing it. Yeah. He did it. Yeah. He thought I should still be in the walker, but I don't even need this. <laughs> but I'm just taking it. You know, thank God I'm still a little shuffling. Praise God. I don't know why yeah, the accident happened, but I just believe Praise that Lord. it was for a purpose. Sure. Yeah. I've been able to witness to so many people about how God's been and what he's done. Amen. Praise Amen. God forever. Amen. And it's so Amen. good just to be here Amen. to Amen. see everyone. Amen. It's just so precious. And all the ones that brought food. Mm -hmm. We had to turn a couple people away because my refrigerator wouldn't handle them no <laughs> I know when Sister Teresa brought, she come in the door, she had a bag from one of the restaurants. And I thought, man, she's bringing in groceries. <laughs> and when I started lifting them out of there, she did bring in groceries. <laughs> and then another one, Sister Dawn brought in her laundry basket. <laughs> she thought she was still cooking for a whole family. <laughs> so, but, but you know what, I appreciate it so much. Amen. You know, I was able, we have a lot of uh, several elderly people that lives around there. <coughs> one, one just had a, um, uh, no, broke her shoulder and I was able to supply some food that was brought in to them. And one of the neighbors that I said, bring two or three containers. I got some food for you here. <laughs> she brought containers. And I said, uh, I said, Gladys, um, Shirley down here, you know, just broke her shoulder. Would you mind if I get up some food if you take it to her? And so I called Shirley. I said, Shirley, I said, the church ladies just brought me so much food. Will you take some if I send it to you? She said, I certainly will. Amen. So I got up some and took she took it down there. The neighbor across the street, mm -hmm. the one that does so much for us, you know, uh, I supplied stuff for them too. You know, thank God. I hope you don't mind if I did that. Yeah. 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 You know, I just praise the Lord for being with me every day. Amen. I thank God for homework. Amen. He's been right there, even though he can't hardly get around. He's helped me do everything. Amen. Put my socks on and help me get into. I'm having to stay in the, in the recliner because I can't I can't get off my back just yet. You know, they warned me if, if I cross my legs and and didn't stay on my back that you know whatever happened to me you know it would be worse. So I'm having to stay in the recliner right now, and that's got my I know that's got my feet and legs swollen. But I know God can take care of that too. Amen. Amen. He can take care of all this other stuff. And I just praise Him. I praise Him so much for my family. How they stepped right in. I had to buy a bit of groceries. What, what uh, Alan don't get, Brian still too gets. He comes in, it's three weeks now. Him and Kathy. Kathy supplies me with food. She uh, sent out some food by Alan. She's having to do babysitting about all the time. You know, but everything that I need has been right there. Thank, Amen. Thank the Lord. I've never prayed for a thing. I just pray and thank God for all Amen. that He's done for me. He's wonderful. Amen. I'm so Amen. glad to be here with all you wonderful people again. Yeah. Yeah. We're glad you're here, sister. Yeah. Amen. had the privilege to kind of lead young adult Sunday school class this morning and um, 
you know, all of us grew up in church together and um, kind of are coming to the point where everybody in that class is adults. You know, it's not like you're teaching to kids or you're teaching to people who aren't on your level. Um, and it was really a really just beautiful thing this morning because um, the Lord had kind of given me a topic for us to discuss. Um, and it could be, it could have went either way, really. <laughs> um, it was just kind of one of those things where it was something we've been taught all of our lives, and I really wanted us to dig into why. I wanted everybody to tell me why they, the why they believe this way or why they didn't believe that way. And um, because it was one of those things in the Bible where it's not black and white. And um, we came out of out of Sunday school, and I said, "Kurt, that is that was such a beautiful representation of what the Scripture talks about of us being unified in the Spirit." Because not one person at that table had a different opinion. It was like, this is not something that, you know, you go in depth and discuss all the time. It was just something that we've always been taught one way on it. And we all just so beautifully had the same thoughts and the same spirit about it. And it was just such a beautiful, wonderful thing to witness that and to know that the Lord had directed each of us personally. We came to that situation all feeling the same way because of what God had talked to us personally in our lives, not because of a scripture that said something, even though the scripture greatly influenced what the Lord had taught all of us on that. Um, it was just, it was just beautiful. The unity this morning, I mean, it was just, it was just really, really cool. Um, and I'm thankful for everyone that gave input and did that. But more than anything this morning, I'm just so thankful to be a child of God and um, so thankful for his benefits, all of them. Um, there are so many benefits to serving him. And um, if you're not serving him this morning, you're really missing out. <clears throat> Let's pray for me. Do you know how it feels to know something's missing and hear a still small voice? You just keep dismissing. Do you know how it feels? To be troubled inside To think just for you On a cross someone died Do you know how it feels When he knocks to surrender Have your sins washed away Never to be remembered And know that it's real Tell me do you know how it feels Then how does it feel To know you're a child has melted and tears started flowing the moment you felt it do you know how it feels to know you've been changed and it seems like the whole world has been rearranged do you know how it feels wherever
what I want and without even me having to really say it or talk to anybody about it or just knowing my thoughts. Because, you know, a couple months ago, just the thought had crossed my mind that I had never been baptized. And then the last time I was in service, where the kids said we were having one. But I was supposed to work today. And so when I went into work and I checked the schedule Friday, you know, they had an invitation for today. Until I was able to take the day off. Where I worked. And I just want to make the work for that. And things are just aligning and just. Away from the clay, God leads. 
not a bit proud of it. But I've got no reason to quit. Just go to the grocery store, I'll lay down while you're gone and get rid of it. And there's usually a nap helps. And uh, we'll go to the gathering. And uh, we got back and just, I, I couldn't I couldn't rest and so I just came on because I thought, well it's just it's gonna it'll go away eventually. <laughs> and I even said, Lord, please, I, I would just like to really go tonight if you could just <coughs> make it go away. And um, so he, has, he said, on the way here, you're not okay, are you? And I'm like, I'm all right. We got here, you're not okay, are you? I probably should go home. I'm all right. And he said it like three or four more times, and really the migraine wasn't leaving. So I did have to leave and go home and medicate again and lay down. But as I was driving home, I was so discouraged. I was just so discouraged. And the devil said, God's not going to do those things for you. Why do you even serve me? Why don't you just quit? And I said, because you ain't got nothing better to offer, buddy. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Why? That's you, is, is the devil going to take my migraines away? No. No. He's a liar. Yeah. yeah. He's a liar. He wants to make me believe that the life for him is better. It is not because I've lived it. Amen. And I, I thank God. That is not a, a wine on my heart. Um, I don't have him as much as I, near as much as I used to. Have no reason for having one yesterday. I can't, I can't figure it out. But. God knows, and I know that all things work together for good Amen. for those that love Him, and I love Him. Amen. And um, Amen. I just really appreciate my life. I appreciate God's comfort and peace. I appreciate His Word. Uh, I was laying there, and there's a picture on my wall of um, Jesus in in the boat. They call it a ship in the Scripture, but it probably wasn't a very big ship. He's standing with his arms wide, and they're all standing there, you know, open mouth. And it's not comical, it's very peaceful. And their clouds are swirling, and the sun's almost coming through, and the water is as still as glass. It's just smooth. And it says, Peace, be still. Yes. And I thought, Yeah, that's Jesus. You know, He's the only one that can be. Speak peace, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter how long we've served God, Amen. no matter if we fall and break our hip, He can still give us peace. Amen. And I'm, I'm so thankful to know His voice this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank God for his help through my week this week. Just appreciate all he's done for me and helped cheer me up. And sitting there with all kinds of stuff on my mind, like he's filling my mind with different scriptures and stuff and just thoughts and stuff. And just want to do his will and thank him for what he's done. This uh, song, I was sitting down in the evening, one evening, and realized I hadn't been, <clears throat> hadn't told my wife. I loved her throughout the day, and so I sent her a song. I said, have, have I told you lately that I loved you? And I started playing the song that I sent her, and God turned around and started telling me he loved me through the song. <laughs> and uh, I was just sitting there thinking how when, if you've ever been in love, um, you see that object everywhere. Like, I can be driving down the road, and there'll be a billboard that has physically nothing to do with God on it. <laughs> but spiritually... Like God talks to me through the billboard, and and uh, it it becomes a blessing. And so I used to wrestle when I was growing up because they would, you know, the the messages and stuff would preach about how you just need to shut your ears to this and shut your ears to that. And there is a lot of things you got to just shut your ears to. But in the grocery stores, they play music, and in you know the hospitals, you, if you're in the hospital, they'll play music and stuff. And uh, so. There was a time in my life where uh, I think it was one of the brothers. Uh, he he started changing some of the songs to uh, to have things to do with God, and and that helped me a lot spiritually. And this is one of those songs that uh, 
God just blessed me with recently. And it has, to me, it has nothing to do with worldliness, if you're spir spiritually on it. It says, have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you there's no one else above you? You fill my heart with gladness. You take away all my sadness. You ease my troubles. That's what you do. As the morning sun and all its glory greets each day with hope and comfort too. You fill my life with laughter and somehow you make it better. You ease my troubles, that's what you do. And there's a love that's divine and it's yours and it's mine just like a son. And all throughout my days, I will give thanks and praise to the one, to the one. Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you there's no one else above you? You fill my heart with gladness and take away all my sadness. You ease my troubles, that's what you do. And there's a love that's divine, and it's yours and it's mine, just like a son. And throughout all my days, I will give thanks and praise to the one, to the one. Have I told you lately that I love you? Have I told you there's no one else above you? You fill my heart with gladness. You take away all my sadness. Lord, you ease my troubles. That's what you do. Kelps for our Sunday school class this morning. Um, first of all, I was totally stoked that um, we had s six kids in our class, and that doesn't sound, but that was a full class, but also that they're our regular kids. They weren't guest kids, you know, and that was really sweet and wonderful. Um, I think that Will and I, we didn't stop smiling the entire time, and it was just such a blessing, and God will give you that. And um, I thank God for... Um, we started the message, and our, or not the message, good Lord, <laughs> well, the lesson, and um, I had a coloring sheet, and it was of John and Jesus in the river, and I said, I'm going to tell you about two cousins today that, that got in the river together, you know, and that intrigued them and everything like that, and we, we started talking about, you know, how Jesus started out as a kid, just like them, you know, he had a mommy. He had cousins, you know, and all these things, and it was, it was a really cool connection and stuff. And then I got to share with them how his cousin, John, supported him. You know, we have stories of Cain and Abel and, you know, Jacob and Esau that are just, to me, the ultimate betrayal. You know, it's so sad that you're, you're flesh, but this is a great example of how these, these uh, John and Jesus were supporting each other in the ministry. And I got to... Um, provoke these children that's what we need to do we need to support each other and we need to push each other and we need to go before each other and be that example for each other and it was just such a great sweet thing and I just thank God that I can't wait to see they're already doing awesome things and they already inspire me personally to be a better Christian and to live a better life but I can't wait to see what they have next I really don't because this this group of kids are just amazing and they just latch on to um, the things about God and they're excited and it's so cool when you're excited <laughs> to, to, for other people to be excited with you. That's why it's so great when we're together because we're like-minded and we, we, I remember when I first got saved that I just wanted to talk about God all the time. I always wanted to. And you know what? God gave me the most wonderful, beautiful, extraordinary, splendid friend to do that with. Jenna. 
and we just would sit and we would talk about God all the time. We would just, and, and, and she never, she never got tired of it. She would just let me go and go. She's like, oh, but this is neat too. This is neat too. And sometimes with Jenna, I feel like Peter and she's Paul. And I'm like, I don't know what she's talking about, but I'm here for it. And, you know, and I thank God that, that <laughs> this little Peter has a Paul. And I'm so glad for that. And God is so wonderful to just think and know and put us perfectly together all the time. And it just sings. It's just it's just beautiful harmony, and I just thank the Lord for it. Um, first of all, we uh, went on vacation, and uh, we were able to go up to Ohio and some friends I watch. I'm always thankful for She's in her 80s, um, and I don't ever want to take for granted um, getting to the time with her, and I'm thankful for that. Um, we got to the Tylers, which are really dear friends, and got really good time with them, and I'm, I'm thankful for um, friends that are family. Um, Mason, at one point, while we were at their house, was like, Mama, our vacations are just all about family, aren't they? And I'm so glad we get to come see family. Mm -hmm. um, and I am too. Um, and then we went to Tennessee, and spent some time in Tennessee. Um, while we were there, Riley started getting snotty in Ohio, and by the time we got to Tennessee, her eye was getting gunky, and normally for her, that means an ear infection. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to find an urgent care in the morning and take her. So I did. I found an urgent care. Um, obviously, her big brothers had the whole vacation planned out, so we had a very tight schedule. Um, and um, so I went to the urgent care, and I walked in, and the lady at the front desk was very nice. But she was like, um, how old is she? And I was like, well, she's one. She said, well, we can't see him under three. She's like, the only thing I can suggest is the ER. And I was like, gee whiz. Um, you know, I'm thinking, I'm trying to figure it out. And as she's sitting there, somebody beside her says something. And she looks at me, she's like, well, what kind of insurance do you have? And I tell her. She's like, oh, that's out of network. She said, Dr. John's here, was trying really hard. And I was like, well, if I just pay out of pocket, how much would that be? And we talked about that. Long story short, the owner of the practice was who was sitting beside her. And the reason they don't see children is because most of her nurse practitioners are not licensed to see children, but she is. So she said, sit down, I'll take a look at her for you, no problem. Um, and I'm thankful for that. I know that seems so small, um, but for Jesus to put people where I needed them at for something that exactly. small, um, I'm so thankful for that. Like all those pieces just lined up, and she told me she was like, you know, I don't, I don't mind at all. You know, and we took care of it. Sure enough, she had an ear infection, um, and we were able to get her medicine, and she felt a lot better for the rest of our vacation. Um, I also want to ignore the songs been on my heart this morning. Um, I recently had a conversation with a friend who went through something really, really hard. And um, she told me, you know, at the beginning of it, right after it happened, she was questioning God and asking how he could let that happen to her. Um, how he could allow it to happen. Um, and so through it, she realized that God can always, that life's hard for people regardless. God didn't make the situation happen to her. But through it, he's been able to show her that he's with her regardless. And he's been able to help her work through some other hard things and, and things that she, she's been needing to work through for a while. Um, and it just reminded me again of how thankful I am that Jesus walks through the hard with me. Um, it rains on the just and the unjust. And um, life's just hard sometimes. It kicks you in the teeth sometimes. Um, I know I've said it before, but I'm so thankful that the difference that I have to do is um, to walk through those hard times with me and to be there for me whenever my life kicks me down. Um, Y'all pray for us. I'm still a little cranky from being sick, um, so I appreciate your prayers this morning. I remember how you told me that life may not be easy. Please. 
this morning. All right, this time I believe we'll take up the offering if we can get a dad and pop for Robert and Tommy. Brother Richard, would you feel comfortable praying for us this morning, brother? I would, sure. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for us being here today. Give us the opportunity to be gathered here in your house to hear your word. We pray that you bless Brother Ken as he speaks to us today. Lift up his word and guide us, dear Lord, throughout the day and throughout this afternoon. We just trust him and pray. Amen. You can be seated. Not trying to cut anybody off or anything, but we've got baptism today, and I feel like that we definitely need to share some thoughts with you before we do the baptism today, because there's probably some folks who may want to be baptized. Um, so let's just settle in and give us your attention by the grace of God, and let's look at what water baptism is really all about, okay? Okay. If you got your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 3. I got a little bit of reading to do. So in Matthew chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. It said, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, Make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and of a leather girdle about his loins. 
and his meat was locust and wild honey. And he went out, then went, then went out to him Jerusalem about all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to the, his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring, therefore, bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire." Before I go any further, i got a little bit more to read, but before I go any further, I want you to understand John the Baptist is actually ushering in a brand new covenant. And that covenant, he's, he's trying to explain to those who are standing there that this isn't going to be the way you guys have lived in the past. You're not going to be able to call yourselves Abraham's seed and continue to live a sinful life because the Messiah is coming who was prophesied about in the Old Testament to take away the sins of the world. Not to leave us in them, but to actually take them away. So John the Baptist is telling them, you know, the, the ax is going to be laid to the root. In other words, he's saying sin is going to be cut out of our lives and taken away. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they struggled with this, right? Because they had a lot of good things going for them. A lot of good religious things going for them. Not spiritual things, but religious things. So John the Baptist is a forerunner of Christ. Now, the word, he should be called John the Baptizer because the word Baptist actually means baptizer. It means Christ forerunner or a person who precedes the coming of someone else. And that's exactly who John was. So in the beginning of Christ's ministry, he's now around 30 years old. John is baptizing in the River Jordan completely submerging, right? That's important. And he's telling them there's going to be a different way. It's not going to be the way y'all did things before. When the Messiah comes, the Messiah is coming. He's going to take away the sins of the world. Now let's see what he says. And he says, whose fan is in his hand, in verse 12, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but, we, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then come Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering, saying unto him, Suffer it not to be, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, <laughs> went straightway up out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now, in a lot of religions, most religions are going to teach you that water baptism is a, a washing away of your sin. Right? Right? But I have a question for you. Did Jesus have any sin in his life? Jesus was without sin, wasn't he? So then why would Jesus need to be baptized for his sins to be washed away? Water baptism wasn't about the washing away of sin. Water baptism, if you'll allow me to share with you this morning, it is an outward expression of an inward possession. It's the biblical right, not R-I-G-H-T, but R-I-T-E, of obedience that expresses the believer's total trust in the reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as a commitment to live and obey Him the rest of their lives. So when we go down to the river this afternoon, and you want to be baptized, 
I want you to understand that what you're saying is all those that are standing there on the bank, you are saying to them by doing this, I'm going to do my best to be obedient to God the rest of my life. I'm going to be a good Christian the rest of my life. I'm a new man. I'm a different person. And that's the expression that you're giving them as witnesses. So this isn't just the world has made water baptism something that, you know, people feel like, well, it's, it's just kind of like a ritual that you do. There's some people who actually believe that whenever, you know, that if you, as long as you're water, water baptized, you'll go to heaven. You can get baptized a thousand times if you want to. If you don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, all you're doing is taking a bath. That's all you're doing. Because the way that this works is you have to believe first. Let me read some more scripture for you. In Mark chapter 4, or chapter 1, verse 4. And again, I'm sorry, I just got a lot of scripture I got to read. In Mark chapter 1, verse 4, it said, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, when we think of the word remission, that word means freedom and deliverance. So John is telling them, look, you want to be free from sin. And what would our world be like? If the vast majority of those who were standing behind pulpits today and those who were teaching Christianity today would tell people, wait, 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 you don't have to sin more or less every day. You can actually live a life where you can be obedient to God, where you can show him your love through your obedience to him by being able through the power of his Holy Spirit that he gives us to be able to tell the devil no and to more importantly, tell yourself no. The devil gets a lot of credit for the things you and I do, but it's actually our problems, not his. So water baptism isn't about, you know, getting submerged in water so people can see your sins washed down the river. No, that's not what it's about. Let's go on to Mark chapter 16 real quick. Again, it's an outward expression of an inward possession. It tells all of those who are observing that you're not going to be the person that you once were. That you're going to be part of Jesus is not only his death, but you're actually going to bury the old man. And that you're going to resurrect a new person, a new person in Christ Jesus. Listen, if you supposedly receive salvation... And absolutely nothing has changed in your life. You didn't get it. I, I'm sorry. You, did, you just didn't get it if nothing changed. If you're still doing the same things that you were doing before, that you knew were wrong, that you had beliefs and values and convictions about that were wrong long before you even received salvation, if you're still doing those things, then you didn't get it. Because there's a transformation that truly takes place when you and I receive Jesus. When the Holy Ghost, see John the Baptist was saying, I'm indeed going to baptize you with water, but there's one coming who's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you what that fire is. That fire isn't an excitement of being saved. That fire is the refining word of God that changes us and de develops us into the Christian that God wants us to be. The, world, the word is a refining fire. It will, sh it will show things to you. It will allow your character to develop as a Christian, but only if you're reading it and listening to it and obeying it. If you're not doing those things, if you're not walking in all the light that you have, then salvation has to come before water baptism. There's no sense in getting baptized if you're not saved. But I thought baptism saved me. No, baptizing don't save you. Again, if you're getting baptized, you're just taking a bath. If you're not saved, you can do that at home. That is not what it is. There has to be an experience in your heart. There has to be a living, breathing, Holy Ghost fire in your heart. 
that, that you want to tell the rest of everybody who's standing there watching this happen to you that this is my witness that I'm a changed individual. This is my witness that I'm going to serve God. This is my witness that I have become a priest for God. A priest. In Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now, this is after the resurrection of Christ. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel, why didn't he say, go ye on to all the world and baptize first? We got to hear the good news. And I'm going to show you that in the scripture. There's a, a beautiful story in the book of Acts about the eunuch. It's a beautiful story. But we've got to not only hear the good news, we got to receive the good news. And once we receive the good news, then we have to start living that good news. And when we start living that good news, the rest of the world's going to take note whether you have ever been water baptized or not. The world is going to take note that you have been with Jesus. Now, I want to um, debunk an idea that you can't get to heaven unless you've been water baptized. There's no truth to that. We see the thief on the cross as Jesus was hanging between two thieves. They both railed on him in one of the Gospels, right? Because a lot of people say, well, that's, the Bible conflicts itself. No, they both railed on him in, in, in one of the Gospels. But then you see in another Gospel that one of them started thinking a little bit, going, you know what, I really deserve this. He don't deserve this. And then in that Gospel, that thief begins to say, why are you saying this? We deserve what's happening to us. He doesn't deserve any of this. And, and you see that thief, his heart changes before God. And Jesus says, today, this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, I'm pretty sure they didn't baptize him after they got him off the cross. I'm pretty sure they didn't baptize him on the cross. He didn't have the opportunity to show the world or to show those who would witness that his life had changed. So water baptism is not absolutely necessary, but I'm going to tell you it is a very good thing to do. It is such a blessed thing to do. Jesus goes on here and he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He says he believeth and is baptized. You have to believe before you can be baptized, right? And that believing, if you'll look it up, it's more than just believing in God. You know, the, the scripture said even the devils believe. This believing is having an experience with him, Right? If my grandsons, Miles and, and T.O. And, and Rowan and uh, Mason and Jackson and Lincoln, if they grow up around their fathers, you might hear, well, I'm, and I'm grateful so far they are, if they grow up around their fathers, you might see, hear someone say, you act just like your daddy. You know that's what they ought to be saying about us Christians. <laughs> you act just like your daddy, Right? You act just like your father. That's what they ought to be saying about us Christians. So Jesus is telling them here, he says, and these signs shall follow them. You know, and, and again, they'll be able to cast out devils. When they talk about speaking with new tongues, this isn't speaking in an unknown tongue. This is being able to speak other languages so that the gospel might be spread. When you look at this, the first step to water baptism is believing and salvation. That's the first step. If you haven't been saved and you're not living for the Lord, there's no reason for you to be baptized today, right? Now, let's see. We've got, so I think Sister Jenna and Brother Caleb could come to me right after service and say, Oh, Brother Ken, Brother Ken, we want to have baby Jesse baptized. <laughs> baby Jesse has no concept of sin. He's not even committed sin. He's completely innocent. But there's a teaching out there that started in Calvinism. 
You know, you need to study a little bit about Calvinism because Calvinism has structured a lot of religions in the world. It's even had an influence on what it calls itself the Church of God. But there's no reason to baptize Jesse. You know, because Jesse has, he hasn't come to an age of accountability. He doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. He's never done any sin. He won't commit sin until he comes to that conscious decision of where he gets to decide whether or not he's going to do something he don't want to do or something he does want to do, but he knows it's wrong. So no, we don't baptize infants, okay? There's no scripture for that at all. In Acts chapter 2, let's go there real quick. In Acts chapter 2, I want to begin reading in verse 38. The scripture here says, For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. They that had gladly received his word were baptized. Again, I'm showing you that the word was received before the act of baptism actually took place. I've had the privilege of baptizing many, many people, and I'm very, very grateful for that. But I've always tried to let them know there's no salvation in water baptism. My wife had an uncle, and he was dying of cancer, and he was under the belief that he could not get to heaven if he was not water baptized. And he, he was dying a horrific death. So his, his, her aunt called and said, would you, would you baptize him? Well, when I went to see him, I went to see him the next day. And, and he was in such bad shape, such bad shape. I said, brother, I don't, I don't, we baptize in the river. I don't think I can get you to the river. We don't have a baptismal pool. But I said, let me check around with some churches. That way we can make sure, you know, it's warm water. We can get you in it. I said, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you can be baptized. But I told him, I said, I, I, you don't have to be water baptized to be saved. And you're going to go to heaven if you've given your heart and life to God. And he told me, he said, I, I know, Brother Kenby. He said, I've never been baptized. And he said, it's just something I want to do because I want to show the rest of the, I want to show my family that I, things are right with me. And I said, okay, brother, we're going to get it done. Well, I called one church and they told me, no, we could not use our baptismal pool. I almost would, I've been so close to the, down through the years of calling the name of that church out. <laughs> I really, I've, I've been that close, but God's always helped me not to do it. I, I called another one. I called another one and they didn't have a baptismal pool. And then, you know, but by that time, it was two weeks later, and now he's, he's in bad shape. He can't get, get out of the house. So I call him up, and his wife says, he's in bad shape. He said, he, uh, you know, he won't even be able to get out of the house. It's okay, Brother Ken. I said, nope, nope, it's not okay. I said, we're going to baptize him. She said, how are you going to baptize him? I said, don't worry about it. I'll be there tomorrow morning. It's Friday. We're going to baptize him tomorrow morning. So I set his little stool in the bathtub. And I got a five-gallon bucket of warm water. And I baptized him in the bathtub. And that man was skin and bone. But he raised his hand. He was like this the whole time. Amen. Just worshiping and thanking God. So it don't have to be in a river. It don't have to be in a baptismal pool, especially at that one church. I wouldn't even go there if I was you. <laughs> Don't have to be there. When we were over in the Philippines doing some missionary work, we baptized some folks in a swimming pool. Later on, Brother Floyd and Sister Best Nephew, he was dying of cancer and I think maybe Sister Beth or Brother Floyd, one of them had told them, and he'd given his heart and life to the Lord. One of them had told him about me baptizing somebody in the bathtub, and he said, would you please see if he can come baptize me in the bathtub? So we sure did. We went and baptized Craig in the bathtub. Baptism is special. It's important. 
You know, it's, it's, it's something that you're telling everyone who's watching, I'm different. And I want you to know I'm different. And I want you not only to know that I'm different, but I also want you to know that I am going to be a minister for God. Amen. Let me explain to you why Jesus was being baptized. Jesus had just turned 30 years old. And in the Old Testament, you could not be a priest unless you were 30 years old. Also in the Old Testament, during, in the tabernacle, before, after you made the sacrifice, you had to go to the brazen laver and you had to wash your hands and your feet before you could go into the holy place to minister for God. So all of those old ceremonial practices were being done away with. There was not going to be any more, alt, uh, any more altars of sacrifice. And any more t you can read, I, I encourage you to go read Hebrews chapter 10. I can't read the whole passage to you this morning because we'll be here for a long time. But I encourage you to go read it because all that changed with the, the crucifixion of Jesus. All of that changed with his sacrifice. And because of that, that all that that brazen sea is what it's called in the Old Testament all that was was a forerunner or a foreshadow of water baptism in the New Testament. Listen, if you're going to be a minister for God and you say, I'm not a minister, Brother Ken. I'm not a preacher. I'm not this. Yes, you are. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you are a priest according to the Scripture. I've shared with you many times that God's whole purpose in the Old Testament and the reason for choosing the Jews was not to make them an empire of kings. It was to make them a group of priests. He meant for the whole tribe of Israel to be priests. Well, now under this new covenant, that's what we are. We are all kings and priests according to the book of Revelation. What does that mean, Brother Ken, that we all minister for God? Brother, sister, if you're going to receive water baptism today, then what you're going to do is you're going to come up out of that water and you're telling the world, I am going to be a minister for God. I am going to witness for God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do everything I can for God the rest of the time I have left. That I'm going to be obedient. Let's think of Jesus' water baptism and what we shared with you earlier. We shared to you, with you that baptism was the biblical rite of obedience that expresses the believer's total trust and reliance in God. Do you not think whenever John the Baptist put Jesus under the water and he come up and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, do you not believe in that moment that Jesus did not think to himself, I have to be obedient to the end? I've got to be obedient to the end. God help me be obedient to the end. Remember his end? Do you remember his end? Do you know what he was saying when he come up out of the water? I will obey and die for you. I will be crucified. And finish what God has asked me to do. I'll be that ultimate sacrifice. That's quite a bit different message than all oh, my sins are being washed away. <laughs> it's quite a bit different message than to say, oh, I got water. I got baptized. Sometimes children will come and they'll say, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. And it's all about the excitement of just getting in the water getting in the cold water and being put under the water and, 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 and just the excitement of, of being involved in that. Moms and dads, you better sit those children down and you better explain to them what they're saying to the world whenever they get baptized. It, it can't just be a fun thing for them to get in the water and be baptized. That, that should not be the way it works. If they don't understand it, then I would strongly recommend that you just tell them, no, honey, you need to wait. You need to wait. Until you can be what you're saying you're going to be when you come up out of that water. That you're going to be exactly what God wants you to be. Again, quite a bit different. If we, let me see here, where am I at? 
They received the word and were baptized. Let's go to Acts chapter 8 real quick. Acts chapter 8. Got a little bit of reading here to do, but I'll try to get through it as quickly as I can. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. It said, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Why would he want him to go there? Imagine, if you will, Philip's being told, I I want you to go to kind of this barren place, this desert place. And the reason why that Philip was actually able to do that is because Philip possessed the Holy Spirit at this time. Philip was living. Philip had been saved. He'd received his salvation. He'd been water baptized. He told the rest of the world, this is exactly what I'm going to do. What you are seeing is living obedience to baptism that Philip had already experienced. He's obeying God by saying, okay, I'll head that direction. The difference between Philip and God is God knew who was on that road. God knew who was down there. And by the way, some people would not even have spoke to this man. Let's see who he is together. And it said, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an Egyptian, if you will, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and who had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Remember, when Solomon was king, the queen of Ethiopia came to to see him, to visit him, because his wisdom had spread all throughout the world, God being with him. And it, she, he, she said to herself, I've got to go see this man. And when she went and seen him and seen God working, it's obvious that that heritage was probably carried back to Ethiopia. And here's this man in Jerusalem who's there for, to worship. Maybe not even to worship God. He might have been there to worship for some other reason. But this is what's happening to him and God's seen it. And it said, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to his chariot. Again, Philip being obedient, right? So he goes and joins himself and Philip, Philip ran tither to him. Boy, God help us to run when God gives us some, when God wants us to do something, God help us to run. We're just too reluctant sometimes. We're We are quick to run to all the things we enjoy in this world, but when it comes to doing the things of God, I'm not so sure we'd be so quick to run. But Philip ran to him. And he said, and he heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and he said to him, he said, understandest thou what thou readest? Are you understanding, Mr. Eunuch, what you're reading? Pay attention to this. And he said, how can I? How can I except some man should guide me? Here's a man in the middle of nowhere reading the book of Isaiah, trying to understand what he's reading. And here's God sitting up in heaven who sees Philip way away from this man. And he sends Philip down there to tell him, hey, Philip, this is what you're reading. This is what you're experiencing. So, and he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. Please come and sit with me and tell me about this. What am I reading here? He goes on. The place of the scripture which he read was this. What a beautiful, it's amazing if you think about this story, how God was leading. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before the shearer, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare this generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The very thing for him to believe in Jesus, he was actually reading but didn't understand it. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, Of whom speaketh the prophet this? 
of himself or of some other man? No. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him doctrine. And preached unto him the law. And preached unto him traditions. No. He preached unto him Jesus. Jesus. You know, I'm thankful for every one of you. I told you my wife and I was talking this morning on the way to to church. And both of us were just being very thankful for being able to be here and worship with y'all. For a lot of different reasons. (laughs) One point, I said, I'm thankful that we don't have to deal with that, or I'm thankful we don't have to deal with this. And it's just different things that different people have to deal with, and some of those things we don't have to deal with, and I'm so thankful for that. So grateful in that. But you didn't save me. As a matter of fact, you know, nothing personal. Don't take it personal, please, but none of you witnessed to me. In the experience that I had, I was starting to go across the church to the little church of God across the street from where we lived, and I started hearing a little bit. I kind of feel like I was just eunuch. I was seeking a little bit, right? And then the next thing you know, in the middle of the night, Jesus shows up, and I was totally transformed and have lived a different life ever since. You know, I, I'll just tell you this, and it's not in a way of boasting. It's in a way of showing you that there's victory. But I spent eight years in the Army. About four, three or four years of that was as a sergeant. I had the foulest mouth you could possibly think of. I'd tell my soldiers before I brought them home for like Thanksgiving and Christmas, because I'd do that for them if they didn't have no place to go. I'd say, now listen, you better watch your mouth before you get in the house there because the sergeant major, which I was talking about Sister Teresa, I said, she'll tear you up. You start using all that foul language, man. Had a horrible time, horrible time. But I want to tell you this. The day after I gave my heart and life to God, for 32 years, I have not said a cuss word. I remember after two weeks of being saved, I remember going, something happened to me. I ain't cussed in two weeks. Something really happened to me because I ain't cussed in two weeks. That's just my testimony. I'm telling you, there's transformations. And I know that there's people who say, but I slipped up. I think Sister Mary has that testimony. She said she had gotten saved and she'd slipped up. But God brought conviction, right? And whenever that conviction came, she repented of it. And she didn't just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. Thank God for conviction. Conviction is a a, a really cool thing. So Philip says, the place in the scripture where he began to preach unto him Jesus. Thank God for that. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest... With all thine heart, thou mayest. The condition for water baptism is believing with all of your heart that the world don't get part of it. That all your heart is in the belief of Jesus Christ. What a name here. What a name. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. Now, I want to tell you something. There may be someone here who's lost, who doesn't know the Lord this morning. Yeah, I know that most, a lot of churches, when you go to church anymore, a lot of it is more what we're going to call motivational speaking. A lot of times the altars are taken out of churches. There's nothing preached that brings conviction. But I have to tell you this morning, we're in the business of people giving their hearts and lives to the Lord. And we want you to feel the convicting power of God because that's what's actually going to change your life. I tried to change my own life without the convicting power of God, and I didn't do too good, Brother Robert. I didn't do too good at all. But when the Spirit of God came in, I was able to do exactly what I wanted, and that was to say no to the things of this world. 
So if you're here this morning and you're lost, you can literally come and give your heart and life to the Lord this morning and receive salvation and get baptized this afternoon. You don't have to wait no period, you know. I, I know there's some people say, well, we'd like to see you wait about six months before you get baptized. What? If you're serving God with your whole heart today when you get up from that altar, bless God, we're going to dunk you. Amen. We're going to dunk you. <laughs> so many ideas out there, right? Thank God for truth. In Matthew 28 and verse 19, the scripture here said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The first thing that has to happen is teaching. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now there is scripture out there. Or there is, there is people out there. And if you go to Acts chapter 2 verse 38, this is where you're going to find where Peter says, Go and baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. So now there's a teaching out there. That, all, that if you don't baptize in the name of Jesus only, you can't be saved. And I'm going to tell you how fanatical it is. Okay? I, I had a sister years ago who was coming and she had some contact with this. And the preacher had found out that they had been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I want to point out to you that this is Jesus speaking here where I'm reading. Go ye into all the world and teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So if you get baptized today, we're going to baptize you according to what Jesus said in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But there's a couple of places in Acts where Peter says baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't mean to leave all that out. He was just summarizing. He, he, Peter did not baptize and create a doctrine around, oh, we only baptize in the name of Jesus. We only baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. He didn't do that. It was just simply how he was using the language. That's all it was. Because he did it twice. Twice. Anyhow, this sister said, Brother Ken, you're not going to believe this. But them folks, the pastor come with one of the members of that congregation at 12 o'clock at night and pecked on my son's window, took him out of the house and baptized him in the name of Jesus only while we were sleeping. Because he didn't think we were going to go to heaven. I said, you, I, that man better thank God he didn't come to my house. Because Sister Teresa don't sleep very heavy. The least little thing, she'd have heard that pecking. I'd have heard that pecking. And it'd have been on. I'm just, what would you have done, Brother Ken? I'd have said, look, you can leave. You need to leave. You're not welcome here. This is how fanatic sometimes people are about some of these teachings and, the, and these ideas. Well, first of all, uh, let, me, let me erase. Hold on just a second. Whoosh. I'm good now. <laughs> let me tell you another thing that's important. If you've ever backslid, is it getting warm in here? Can you turn that air on for us, Brother Kevin, please? Thank you. If you've ever backslid and got away from God, if you've ever lost that obedience to the Lord, if you've ever lost that witness that you had, I would strongly recommend that if you've gotten that back, that if you've given your heart and life back to the Lord, I would strongly recommend that you get baptized again. Why, Brother Ken? Because if you're on the road doing exactly what God wants you to do and you're being obedient, all you're doing is telling those who are standing there witnessing, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm being obedient this time. I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to be a priest. I'm going to do everything I can to live for him this time. Ain't a thing wrong with that if you want to be baptized again, especially if you backslid. I'd strongly consider it. Don't have to. But remember, this is just an outward expression of an inward possession. You're telling those who are watching I'm not living the way I used to live. I'm not going to do the things I used to do. I'm a different person. I am buried in Christ. I, I, I am dead in, in, to my sins, and I am resurrected in victory. That's what you're saying whenever you get water baptized. So we mentioned the thief on the cross. We mentioned a little bit about the brazen laver. I want to just share a little bit more about that. So when we see Jesus being baptized, it, it's a foreshadow of the beginning of his ministry as what does the scripture say? 
Christ is our high priest. And remember, the Levitical priesthood had more than one priest. They had multiple priests. There were many priests, more than one. But there was one high priest who went into the holiest of holies, right? So if you remember, I wish I would put up a picture of the tabernacle. If you remember the tabernacle, the very first part of that is a holy place. But behind the veil is the holiest of holies. And the high priest only went in there once a year to make atonement for all of Israel's sin. And their sins were rolled ahead. But remember, whenever Jesus was crucified, that veil was rent from top to bottom, thank God. Because our high priest don't go into the presence of God once a year. Thank God our high priest stays in the presence of God. Sits on the right hand of God. Has his ear right beside him. That's our high priest now. That's what the New Testament said. He's our high priest. We are priests under him. Again, I encourage you to go read Revelation chapter 10, or I mean Hebrews chapter 10. Go with me to Revelation chapter 1 because I want to confirm to you that we are all priests. Let me tell you something about human beings. Do you know that it was never God's plan for Israel to have a king? Did you also know that it was never God's plan for Moses to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God would have rather did that himself. But the problem with human being is we do better some, for some reason seeing tangible things. If I, can, if I got someone I can follow, right? And this happens in churches all the time. And this is why men standing behind pulpits sometimes have more power than what they should have. You can blame it on them if you want to, but actually the people. The people have chosen, well, whatever he tells us to do, that's what we're going to do. Because, you know, he's been our preacher for years. You better never do that. You better make sure that the life that you're living is one sanctioned by God and his Holy Spirit in his word. Because men can lead you right off a cliff. Right off a cliff. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, the scripture said, let's go back up to verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us, who's that? That's us. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You are a priest this morning. You are a priest. Not in the sense of being a Catholic priest. You're a minister. You're someone who should be sharing the gospel. You're someone who should be living the word of God. They should see that in your life. They should see it in your conversation. They should see it in every part of who you are. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3. I'm, I'm almost done. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. The scripture said, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Do you remember, you know, it'd be, it'd be really something, probably some of you'd be offended this morning, but if I said, all right, all of you who have not been baptized, just line up here on the front pew, Right? And I went down through there and said, oh, you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. All right, let's go eat. <laughs> I'd be offended by that, right? No, when you're baptized into Christ, the word baptism means to immerse. 
to totally be covered, right? And what this is, is it's symbolic. And all it is is symbolic of, now you're not covered with the world anymore. No, you're not baptized in Christ. You've not only been baptized into him, you put him on. You're wearing Jesus. Your conversation is Jesus. Your behavior is Jesus. Your words are Jesus. That you're living witness and minister of the power of Christ working in your life. That, that's much different than just throwing some water on you. In Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? What does the word continue mean? Keep going, keep doing, right? Now, if you'll notice the way this is written, when it got translated over into the English, there were no other words substituted in here because there's nothing italicized. I want, you to, I want to point that out to you, okay? So, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. What does that mean? That God forbids it. I don't want you to continue in sin. Don't keep acting the way you're acting. Don't keep doing the things you're doing. Let me help you be the person that you want to be. Let me give you my spirit. And if you read and you pray and you fast and you do all the, the spiritual disciplines that you need to do to become a true you know, Christian and live the way that God wants you to because you got to do those things. you got to do those disciplines. Then I can help you say no to the enemy, but more importantly, say no to yourself. That's where you're going to struggle the most. A lot of people get, give the devil credit. Oh, the devil made me do it. The devil wasn't within 100 miles of it. You wanted to do it before he ever showed up. <laughs> he just told you, yeah, go ahead and do it. <laughs> And you did. He said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin, not in sin, it says dead to sin. Pay attention to the language. What does that mean? We're dead to it. We're not doing it anymore. You know, this is a horrible thing to say. And I, I know, <laughs> you know, I know preachers who have told people this whenever they left their congregation. You're dead to me. You're dead to me. What does that mean? I'm not having anything else to do with you. You don't exist. That's what he's saying here. Those who are dead to sin. I'm not having anything to do with you anymore. You're not going to exist in my life. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ... We're baptized into his death. Let's think about his death. What did the death of Jesus Christ do? What did it do? It took away the sins of the world. We are baptized into that death. And we are, when we are baptized into that death, this is a spiritual baptism. This is the Holy Ghost. This is the fire baptism. I thank God for water baptism. But boy, I thank God for that Holy Ghost baptism. And it ain't running around speaking in an unknown tongue. Holy Ghost baptism is holy living. It's living the way that God wants you to live so that the world sees. What happened to you, Floyd? You do not act like you used to act. Brother, what in the world happened to you? I gave my heart and life to the Lord. I knew something had happened to you, Brother Floyd, because you don't act the same way you used to. Shortly after I got saved, I went home to visit my mom. I walked in Kmart. I was coming out of Kmart. A couple of my buddies I played football with met me there on the sidewalk. And he said, man, Busky, how you doing? We heard you went in the service and everything. I said, yeah, I did. And me and you was in there a long time. Wasn't you? Yeah, eight years. Heard you went overseas. Yeah, I did all that. Well, where are you living now? I live down in North Carolina. Well, they knew me before. And the first thing they said to me was, boy, I, get, I, I guarantee you they got some good white liquor down there, don't they? I said, I wouldn't know, boys. I gave my heart and life to the Lord. I said, I'm actually doing a little preaching now. 
I'm serious. There was silence for a short period. I probably could have threw a golf ball in one of their mouths. I mean, it, it really happened. I mean, it was like, like that. And the next thing out of their mouths is, it's good to see you, Busky. Take care, man. Gone. See, I didn't only show them the change. I told them the change. And I don't know if you all know this, but I think I shared it with you. Not too long ago, I got invited to my um, high school. I don't know. How many years has it been? 1983, I graduated high school. Would it be 40 years? 40 this? 23? Yeah, 40 years ago. So I got invited to that. And the, and the, the girl that I was in my, my class with, she sent me an email. She goes, we would love for you to come and tell us about what's been going on in your life. We all heard you became a preacher. Our lives change when we're baptized into Christ. He goes on here and he says, Therefore we are buried with him by the baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. You know what you're telling people when you get water baptized? You know what you should feel like when you come up out of that water? Not that your sins are gone. Those were gone whenever you got your salvation. When you come up out of that water, you ought to be saying, everybody on the shore ought to be able to look at you and say, it's a new life. It's a new life, a new life in Christ. I'm thankful to be able to not only have been baptized, but I'm also to be able to baptize people. It's such a blessing. Today, as you think about getting baptized, just a couple requirements. Number one, are you saved? If you ain't saved, you don't need to be baptized. Baptism ain't going to save you. Number two, I said just a couple. Are you getting baptized to show those people who are watching that, hey, I'm, I'm going to live a different life. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. That old man or that old person is buried and a new person is living for the Lord. Now, if you've been saved for a while, they should have already seen that. This is just following through. That's all it is, just following through. This morning, if you're here and you're not saved, if you're not living for the Lord, there's a couple things I want to share with you. Number one, he loves you enough to actually put you in here this morning. He loves you enough that he spoke to you and, and said you should go. That's pretty important if you ask me. Number two, he doesn't care what condition you're in. You need to understand this. There are people out there who say, I can't go to church till I stop doing this. I can't get saved till I stop doing that. I can't get saved till I quit doing this. You can't quit doing those things. If you could have, you already would have. He don't care what you're doing. He don't care what condition you're in. He don't care what's going on in your life. He wants to save you. He loves you in the very condition that you're in this morning. Whatever that condition may be. <laughs> and if you want to give your heart and life to the Lord this morning and you want to surrender and say, Lord, I'm done fighting the battles of life. I'm done fighting. You know, it's, it's like a, a someone said, I think Sister Casey said, you know, about the friend who went through a hard time. Listen, Jesus, don't take away all the hard times in life. It don't, you still live your life. There are still things that are going to happen to you. You're still going to have struggles and trials and battles. There's bad things going to happen to you. That's the world that we live in. The only hope that we have to escape this, though, is to live for Jesus. And I will tell you this. One of the benefits of giving your heart and life to the Lord is, is Brother Brian, whenever they find out that your wife's got cancer, that you don't walk through that alone. You walk through that with the Lord. Whenever the Lord takes your, whenever the Lord takes your little boy, and you don't walk through that alone. 
That is the benefits of living for God while you're here. You're not by yourself. When he promised you glory to God in the book of Acts, he said, tarry at Jerusalem till the comforter comes. And thank God there have been times in my life when I've had to tarry a little bit. But as long as I tarry, glory to God, in just a little while, the comforter showed up, glory to God. And he gave me the peace that I needed to be able to walk through that valley that seemed so dark and so wide and so alone, thank God. But he was right there whenever he showed up. People walk through those valleys alone a lot of times. And it changes their character. Sometimes it makes them tougher. Other times it makes them weaker. I hope this morning that you have an understanding of water baptism. That it is not just... You know, going down to the river and doing something that everybody else did who got saved. It's not what it is. It's an outward expression of an inward possession. It's a desire to show the world, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Let's stand. Do we have a song? Any kind of song? Okay. Kelby's got a song. As they sing this morning, if you need to come, the altars are open. If you want to give your heart and life to the Lord this morning, and you want to be baptized this afternoon, we'll do that. There's no waiting period. But just make sure that you serve him with your whole heart. Sing one more verse. I now believe thou dost receive, for thou hast died that I might live. And now henceforth I'll trust to thee, my Savior. seated. I want to thank the Lord for a couple of things. I want to thank the Lord's sister Norwood's here this morning. I want to thank the Lord's sister Beth is here this morning. I want to thank the Lord that Brother Richard and Brother Chase come back to be with us again this morning. I also want to thank the Lord that uh, Brother Manny is with us again this morning. And of course, Sister Carol. <laughs> Any prayer requests before we dismiss? Then I'll give you the information about the baptism, okay? Any prayer requests? Let's remember Brother Johnny in prayer. He's still not doing very well. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I talked to Brother Nathan yesterday. And um, for those of you who've been to Haiti with us, the, um, the compound was actually overtaken by gangs. They stole all the vehicles. They vandalized the church building and stole all the sound equipment out of the church building. 
They stole all of Brother Nathan's clothes and all the stuff out of the mission house. They vandalized all the mission house. And they burnt some houses of the people who were in the congregation. So things were not good over in Haiti at all. Brother Nathan is in the States. We're thankful for that. Um, and he did say that Sister Vinette, I mean, some of you may remember her when you went. She's still handling the finances, and so she's getting the finances to people who have had their houses burnt, and she's trying to get their homes rebuilt for them, so we still need to try to keep supporting them if we can, okay? So um, just remember them in prayer, all right? And uh, Brother Nathan said he would come and hold us a revival, so we're going to try to get that set up pretty soon. If you've never heard Brother Nathan preach... You should get him for your preacher. I'd be glad to sit here with you guys. <laughs> He's amazing, I'm telling you. Any other prayer requests this morning? We were uh, in the house, and one of our water pipes broke, and we just shot a gush out everywhere. We tried to get it fixed yesterday, but we don't know if it's permanently fixed or not. So. Let's remember that in prayer. Amen. Daddy, there's a little girl that goes to Hudson Elementary School that's just in kindergarten that just got diagnosed with lymphoma. Um, and so she'll be starting cancer treatments. Just pray for her and her family. Amen. Any other prayer requests? Uh, brother Candy, Dad, he needs to go hang out with his older brother for a little while. So he took a weekend trip with him. So just remember them. Safe travels back. Amen. Let's remember that prayer. Any others this morning? Chase? A majority of my friends are atheists mm. and they consider themselves a part of the LGBT community. Mm. They have a lot of issues and trauma and the whole God help them work through it and they might come to Christ. Hey, Brother Chase, we'll yes. that prayer. Sister KD? I missed two appointments in June at the center and the last month I did. <laughs> Like blood work coming up. Can you just think positively about that? Amen. Let's remember that in person. Okay. Remember Andre and prayer. We have another grandbaby coming soon. And I just I just know that, you know, that that last bit of time is is a little anxious. So I just want to keep her in prayer. I don't know why you're praying for her, I'm praying for Greg. <laughs> I hope you make it through it, pal. You've done it a couple other times, so maybe you'll make it up through it this time. Don't laugh. No matter what happens, don't laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Let's remember Sister Andre and Brother Greg as the baby comes. Okay. And we also remember that poor old Bert Israel. We've got some more ships that's been sitting over on Spanish water. Um, my nephew's in the Navy in Hawaii. I don't know if he's on one of these ships. Amen. I told you a while back, several months ago, our world's changing. It's going to keep changing. It's going to keep changing. Anything else? Okay. All right, so if you're going to be baptized this afternoon, if you want to be baptized this afternoon, um, I put the information on our group text, but some people may not be on the group text, so I'm going to give it to you again. It is Carson's Chapel, and the address is 2561 Tom's Creek Road, 2561 Tom's Creek Road. Most of you should know where it's at, um, but if you don't, the baptism will be at 4 o'clock. Um, if some of you who are here in the congregation could grab a couple of hymnals as you walk out, so we have some hymnals there, we're going to sing a couple of songs out there. And do something a little bit different too. We're going to ask if anybody's got a testimony about their baptism whenever they were baptized. There are changing um, rooms out there, so you can bring some change of clothes. There's men and women's. Um, make sure you bring a towel. 
And, you know, I know the water's going to be cold, but I looked at the, the weather, and at 4 o'clock, it's supposed to be 82 degrees. It's not going to help. <laughs> it's still going to be ice water, but at least when you get out, there won't be wind blowing and it raining. We baptized one time up there when it was raining, cold rain. Boy, it was horrible. <laughs> so... If you got any questions about the baptism, that'll be at 4 o'clock. Then there's no service after that because the baptism will take a little while. Um, and then I think the only thing we have for this week is we've got skit practice on Saturday at 3 o'clock. Is that right? The 19th. Am I missing anything else for this week? Oh, that's right. Jesse's birthday party is on Saturday. At what time? 1 o'clock. So Saturday's a busy day. There are too many people talking. Say what? Oh, Sister Anna's wedding. Okay, let's remember that as well. Is it at your house? Okay. Okay. All right, so the Jesse's party is at Brother Caleb and Sister Jenna's. Also, we got a bunch of birthdays in April. First of all, I want to thank Sister Amanda and Sister Stacy and all those who helped and brought the food. Robert cooks good salmon and chicken. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you it was delicious. Anyhow, good time last night for the couples retreat. Thank you so much for that. It was a wonderful time. Um, well, we have a lot of birthdays in April. My son-in-law's is on Wednesday. Um, my daughter Anna's was on the 11th. Some brother Roger, we already sang to him. Is there anybody else this week? Kelby's, yeah. We're going to wait till the end of April for that, right? So let's just sing happy birthday for everybody who's, you got, oh, Sister Janet, you got a birthday in April? All right. Let's stand. Happy birthday. Brother Tommy, good to have you back with us. Would you dismiss us in prayer, brother? Dear yeah, Father, Lord, we thank you for all the songs testifying, Lord, this morning. And knowing...